Introduction to the Study of Philosophy by John McTaggart Ellis McTaggart These lectures are chiefly intended for those students who, though not engaged in the systematic study of philosophy, may desire to learn something of the objects, methods, and present problems of metaphysic. No previous knowledge of the subject will be assumed, nor will any course of reading be required in connection with the lectures. The treatment adopted will not be historical, but will deal mainly with the present position of metaphysical inquiries. Introduction 1. Metaphysic is not a subject which can be made easy for everyone, but for those who have some power of thought and training in thought, it is possible to give a comparatively brief account of its nature, methods, problems, and utility, not of its results, for none are universally accepted. 2. Its definition may be, provisionally, taken to be the systematic study of the ultimate nature of reality. Philosophy is a rather wider term, for it includes ethics, the systematic study of the ultimate nature of the good, its systematic nature separates it from such a study of reality as is found in poetry. Theology deals with metaphysical problems, but not always in a metaphysical way. 3. Science also consists in the systematic study of reality. Now, metaphysic is not the aggregate of the sciences, nor merely their common principles. In the first place, Metaphysic considers certain subjects not dealt with at all by science, as God, immortality, the highest good, etc. 4. And then science is not interested in the ultimate nature of reality in the subject it deals with, but only in what is comparatively on the surface. Thus, science assumes as ultimate, without inquiry, certain premises. 7. What is the practical utility of metaphysic? Does it give us guidance? I do not think that a man's views on questions of practice are much affected by his views on metaphysical problems. This is fortunate, for there is so little agreement about metaphysic that, if it were otherwise, our moral life would be chaotic. 8. The utility of metaphysic is to be found, rather, in the comfort it can give us which is still more directly practical. When we look around the world, we find much misery, due partly to the action of matter on spirit, partly to the actions of one spirit on another, and partly to the internal defects of spirits. 9. Some people are not troubled by the general question of how much evil there may be in the universe, but are only interested in the amount which they can directly observe or anticipate in the immediate future. For such persons, there is no practical utility in metaphysic. 10. But people who have no interest in the more general question are rare, since, for example, all theological interest is incompatible with such a position, and interest of this sort is likely to increase as the immediate evils of our present life are mitigated by the advance of society. 11. Now, the most natural attitude, as we shall see, upon these questions is dualism, i.e. that mind and matter are equally real, and each exists in its own right. And dualism would tend to confirm those fears as to the general state of the universe which had been excited by ordinary observation. 12. And if we think rather more deeply, the most natural tendency is towards materialism, which is still more depressing. 13. But, if we go further, we may succeed in arriving at a belief in idealism, and that gives us a much more cheerful view of the universe. 14. Some people, of course, succeed at arriving in an idealist view without the aid of metaphysic, but the help of some form of religion claiming to be revealed. But, the number of those who are unable to do this is increasing. 15. The practical need for metaphysic is thus growing. 
Of course, we have no right to believe a particular metaphysical theory because we could not be happy unless it is true. But if our only chance of believing it to be true is to study metaphysic, then its connection with our happiness gives us ample practical justification for the study. 16. Metaphysic and science advance in quite different ways. Science, by small and frequent additions to a body of generally admitted truths. Metaphysic, by the substitution of one complete system for another. And in metaphysic, there is no decisive consensus of opinion on any point of importance. 17. The reason of this difference is to be found partly in the greater difficulty of the subject, and partly in its closer connection with our practical interests. But it is chiefly due to the fact that metaphysical problems are much more closely connected with one another than scientific problems. 18. The continual succession of opposed systems and philosophy may be regarded dogmatically from the point of view of one of the systems, or skeptically, as a ground for distrusting all of them. 19. Or, we may consider that each of them has some truth in it, though not the whole truth. In this case, we shall be able to view the multiplicity of systems not merely as so many errors, with the possible exception of one, but as approximations toward the truth which we may find reason to believe are becoming gradually closer. 20. We shall classify the views we shall consider according to their attitude to the relation of matter and mind. This will give us three forms, dualism, materialism, and idealism. But before discussing these, we must inquire whether we can know anything at all, and so consider skepticism. Section 2. Skepticism and Agnosticism 1. Skepticism, other than mere general caution, is either absolute, which denies the possibility of all knowledge about philosophy or anything else, or agnosticism, which, broadly speaking, admits the knowledge of science in everyday life, but denies the possibility of philosophical knowledge. 2. Causes which tend to make us generally cautious about all our knowledge, and which especially tend to prevent us from being too dogmatic in philosophy. 3. There is far less dogmatic certainty about philosophy at present than at earlier times. This is largely due to the greater attention paid to the history of philosophy, but caution and reserve as to the results we have reached do not paralyze inquiry. Absolute skepticism, which tells us that we never can know anything, would, of course, paralyze all inquiry. 4. How are we to find any ground from which to attack skepticism? For as the skeptic denies everything, it would seem that we could have no common ground with him. But the skeptic does not deny the truth of his own position. 5. Thus, we may say to him, Either you are certain that nothing can be known, and then this is a proposition which you think can be known, or you are not certain and nothing can be known, and then you have given up absolute skepticism. 6. Nor can he escape by saying only, Perhaps nothing can be known, for if he does assert this, then he asserts that this possibility can be known. And if he does not assert it, it cannot help him. 7. If the skeptic will not admit these arguments, then indeed we cannot argue with him. But these arguments would be denied by so few people, if by any, that we have strengthened our position by resting it on them, till it is practically impregnable. 8. It does not follow from what has been said that we should be entitled to dispose of skepticism by saying that we had an immediate certainty of its falsehood. There are ultimate propositions which neither require nor admit of proof, but the falsity of skepticism cannot be one of them. 9. Nor are we justified in disposing of skepticism by asserting that its defenders cannot believe what they say, 
for there is no reason to suppose that they do not, nor would the fact, if true, be relevant. Nor would it be relevant to say, what, no doubt, is to a certain degree true, that they do not act as if they did believe it. 10. We now proceed to agnosticism, which admits that we know what is presented to our senses, and can reason on it to a certain extent, but denies that we can know the reality behind the presentations. These presentations are called phenomena. The reality behind is called noumena, or things in themselves. 11. The name is sometimes but incorrectly applied to an absence of certainty on metaphysical subjects, or to an assertion that nothing has been discovered about them, without raising the question whether such discoveries are impossible. 12. Agnosticism, in the strict sense, generally rests itself on the subjective element in all knowledge, which is asserted to render that knowledge untrustworthy, so far as the representation of absolute reality goes, though it may have some practical value. 13. But the supposition that there is an irremovable subjective element of such a nature as to vitiate our knowledge of absolute reality is not justifiable. 14. And, again, if the agnostic says there is nothing behind the phenomena, his agnosticism vanishes. For then there is nothing behind the phenomena, and, in knowing them, we know all the reality that there is. 15. And if he says that there is something behind the phenomena, then he knows something about it, namely its existence, which is inconsistent with agnosticism. And again, his theory will require that he knows some relation which exists between the phenomena and the noumena. Also, he must know that its nature is such that it can never be known to us. 16. All this is a good deal of knowledge about that which cannot be known to us. And not only is this inconsistent with agnosticism, but no reason could be given why we could never know any more of that which we admittedly know so much. 17. The agnostic is quite right when he says that we can only start with what is given in experience. His error lies in supposing that we cannot go beyond it. 18. On the general question of how far we are entitled to trust the power of the mind to find out truth, it leads equally to contradictions to distrust it altogether, or to trust it completely. All we can say is that the mind is capable of making mistakes, and is also capable of correcting them. Section 3. Dualism, Absolute and Relative 1. The view of dualism, the independence of mind and matter, is practically the same as that taken by common sense, before beginning metaphysical thought, that is. In absolute dualism, they are taken as neither dependent on one another, nor on anything else. In relative dualism, matter and finite spirit are taken as independent of one another, but dependent on a third reality, usually conceived as a creative, infinite spirit. 2. Absolute dualism, however, is scarcely a position natural to common sense. The tendency of the latter is to regard mind and matter as externally connected, as in relative dualism. 3. The strength of absolute dualism lies in the fact that the world we see so strongly suggests that something analogous to our reason has considerable but not complete power in it. This does not go well with materialism or idealism, but would be quite compatible with absolute dualism. 4. But we cannot deny, except by passing into skepticism or materialism, that mind and matter act causally on one another and this makes some kind of unity between them. Now, it may well be doubted if such a unity could exist unless mind and matter had to some degree a common nature, and if they had, absolute dualism would be false. 5. Again, 
Have we any conception of what matter would be independent of its observation by mind? Our idea of matter has certain components received by means of our five senses. It also contains other elements, such as substance, causality, and the like, which are not given by the senses, but added by the work of the mind. 6. The secondary qualities are admitted not to exist in matter taken by itself, but then that matter has a nature which we have never experienced and cannot even imagine, one which consists of primary qualities without secondary qualities. Again, take extension, the most fundamental of the primary qualities. Can we form any idea of it apart from an observing mind? It cannot be extension as seen, nor yet as touched, for these differ from each other with the same object, and each of them also varies according to the circumstances under which we see or touch. 8. Nor can it be any common quality of visual and tactual extension, for no such quality can be observed. 9. All we are entitled to infer from the facts is that there is some reality outside us which is a part cause of our sensations, but we have no right to suppose that in any way resembles them. Therefore, the primary qualities can be no more ascribed to matter in itself than the secondary could be. 10. As for such categories as substance and causality, we do not get them through sensations, and they can therefore only be the work of the mind. 11. But what reason have we to accept them as valid? None. Except that, without them, we could not make a coherent theory of things. But, if matter exists in itself, quite independently of our minds, what right have we to say that its nature must be such as would admit a theory of it which would be coherent to our minds? If we keep absolute dualism, we have no right to predicate of matter categories due to the workings of our mind. 12. Thus, if we separate matter from an observing mind, no part of the conception is left, and the assertion of its existence is meaningless. Now, mind is not in the same position, for even if it could only exist in company with matter, it certainly exists for itself, and not merely for matter. Whereas the whole nature of matter has been resolved into its relation to mind. 13. We now pass on to relative dualism. This is very close to the position of the natural man before he studies metaphysic, but it loses the advantage that absolute dualism had of being specially able to explain such an apparently heterogeneous universe as this. For it refers all things to a single mind, and so the prima facie partial irrationality of the universe is as much a difficulty for it as for idealism. 14. With relative dualism, the difficulty which, in the case of absolute dualism, arises as to the interaction does not take place, since the theory admits some common nature belonging to both mind and matter. 15. But still, if matter and finite mind are to be on an equality, it will be necessary that matter should have some existence in itself, independent of its existence for mind. And then the same difficulties will occur as to primary and secondary qualities, which occurred in the case of dualism. 16. It is no doubt reasonable to hold that my sensations are not exclusively caused by myself, but this does not justify a belief in a self-existent matter, for the cause in question might be another self, either divine or human. 17. Barclay's explanation would account for the existence and regularity of the sensations as well as a dualistic theory while avoiding the difficulties of such a theory. 18. Nor is it legitimate to appeal to our instinctive belief in matter, nor to demand that people who disbelieve in it shall consent to thrust their hands into the flame of a candle. Section 4. Materialism and Presentationism 1. Materialism holds that matter is the only reality in the universe, 
and that all activities commonly ascribed to mind are really activities of matter. 2. Materialism has the recommendation of being a monism, and therefore a more perfect explanation of the universe than a dualism can ever be. 3. And, starting from the natural position of dualism, it seems more natural to reduce the universe to matter than to mind. In the first place, the number of laws relating to matter which we know is much greater than the number of laws relating to mind. 4. And matter forms one great whole, persisting through many ages. Mind appears in the form of separate individuals, isolated from each other by matter, and each ceasing, so far as our observation goes, after a very few years. 5. Also, the changes which we can observe mind to make in matter are comparatively insignificant, while a very slight change in matter will either destroy mind or, at least, remove it from the only circumstances in which we can observe its existence. All these characteristics make matter appear much more powerful and important than mind. 6. Also, idealism was weakened by being supposed to be bound up with certain theological doctrines, which became discredited. All these things account for the great strength of materialism some years ago. 7. There has been a reaction against this, but the extent of the reaction has been exaggerated. It still remains the belief to which most people tend on first leaving an unreflective position, and many remain there. Science is a large element in our lives now, and if we try to make science serve as metaphysic, we get materialism. 8. Nor is it to be wished, even by idealists, that materialism should become too weak, for idealism is seldom really vigorous, except in those who have had a serious struggle with materialism. 9. Materialism cannot be disproved by the prima facie difference between thought and motion, for there is a great prima facie difference, for example, between heat and motion. Nor can such imperfect order and symmetry as we are able to observe in the universe be said to be incompatible with materialism. 10. It would be very difficult to disprove materialism if we once accepted the reality of matter as a thing in itself. But, as we saw when considering dualism, such a reality of matter is untenable, and this conclusion is even more obviously fatal to materialism than it was to dualism. 11. And again, if materialism is true, all our thoughts are produced by purely material antecedents. These are quite blind, and are just as likely to produce falsehood as truth. We have thus no reason for believing any of our conclusions, including the truth of materialism, which is therefore a self-contradictory hypothesis. 12. We now come to presentationism, which rejects the existence alike of matter and of selves, and which makes the ultimate reality to be units of mental occurrences, combined either by pure chance or by laws analogous to those of mechanics. 13. It may seem curious to rank a theory which denies matter with materialism, but what is important is not the name which it is given to reality, but the sort of action which is held to express its real nature. 14. Now, presentationism denies that the ultimate nature of reality is adequately expressed by any of the characteristics which prima facie appear in mind. And it is asserted that the ultimate nature of reality causes it to act in ways which are adequately expressed by the laws prima facie evident in matter. It thus makes the nature of reality resemble matter more closely than mind, and so is properly ranked by the side of materialism. 15. It is generally approached through materialism, and is more difficult to reach than materialism, though not so difficult as idealism. It escapes, of course, the objection to materialism, which rests on the impossibility of conceiving matter as a thing in itself. 16. But the other argument against materialism applies equally to presentationism 
and this is the only argument against presentationism. It should be carefully considered. 17. Presentationism is incompatible with the truth of general propositions, and is therefore incompatible with itself, since it can only be expressed by a general proposition. 18. And closer analysis shows that it is incompatible even with particular propositions, since these a involve the union of two terms, b involve the use of general ideas. 19. Thus, the theory breaks down because it leads to complete skepticism, invalidating both general and particular propositions. And complete skepticism is, as we have seen before, self-contradictory. 20. The theory is more often called sensationalism or phenomenalism, but neither of these names is completely satisfactory. End of Part 1 of Introduction to the Study of Philosophy by John McTaggart Ellis McTaggart